All right, thank you all for being here. And yeah, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, continuous digital biomarkers. Uh, for those of you who don't know about biomarkers, you're probably familiar with getting a uh, blood test. So it looks a little bit like this if you've never gotten one before. And so uh, we think the future uh, looks a little bit more like this, uh, where, where consumer grade devices like the Apple Watch, the Fitbit and others are used to derive a set of biomarkers continuously. Um, this is a very different world. The good thing about continuous digital biomarkers is they're surprisingly engaging. They reflect everything in your life, but they also have unique challenges. Uh, we have 100,000 data points per person per year uh, from something like the Apple Watch or Health Kit. Uh, and so we need a combination of human and artificial intelligence. So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of the implications. Uh, we'll dive right into it. So for those of you who haven't worn uh, one of these devices before, they're actually very diverse. Um, in addition to the awesome research devices that we heard about uh, just in the session before, there are now on the market, if you go to Best Buy, you can find all of these things. So there's the Fitbit and the Apple Watch, uh, which are pretty well advertised. You may not have seen some of the Android devices, which are the other ones. Um, some of them actually look a lot like watches, um, but all of these devices have a heart rate sensor on the back. And if you look at that data, it looks a little bit like this. Um, so these are eight examples of, of real heart rate. Uh, these are taken Apple Watch using continuous recording, and they fall into a couple of categories. So we'll start with sleep. Um, if you look at restful sleep, you'll notice that every 90 minutes there was a spike in heart rate. Those are your REM cycles. You're supposed to have those. Now, some of you may be like me and have trouble getting to sleep, and you might have a nightcap, a little drink of something to get to sleep. Um, and that can help, uh, except it screws up your first couple of REM cycles. And you can see in the very bottom left, um, this person's first two REM cycles have a much higher average heart rate. So it shows up there. Um, fitness, I mean, obviously, it's a huge use case for these devices, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the metrics that you can get. Um, out of these, um, but stress shows up as well. So this is driving in rush hour traffic. Um, some of you may have experienced that this morning. Um, this person's heart rate is above 120, and you notice that there's a fine pattern of variability. We'll talk a little bit about heart rate variability, uh, what that means and when you can get uh, out of it. And then uh, one, one user actually recorded his Microsoft interview, and you can almost see the moment when he was asked to reverse the link list. So it picks up everything, picks up everything. Um, and then this is not primarily a conference about illness, but um, I thought I would touch on a little bit of the work we're doing with UCSF cardiology. Uh, we're actually using these general consumer devices uh, to detect um, important abnormal heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, uh, which are respectively a highly chaotic heart rhythm and a heart rhythm that's way too stable. Um, so with that, We'll kind of go into some traditional heart rate biomarkers. Uh, these are picked up from the medical literature, but they apply to both uh, ends of the spectrum. So athletes will use these biomarkers, um, as well as heart failure patients. So first thing we'll start with is heart rate variability. Um, so these are the two examples um, of kind of like a regular commute and a reverse commute. Um, and the thing to notice is that even when you're in normal heart rhythm, you see this periodic variation um, in, in heart rate variability. And if you look at the medical literature, um, people have all sorts of ways to quantify this. Everything from just taking the standard deviation of each beat to beat interval um, to doing Fourier or wavelet analyses. There, there are literally dozens of heart rate variability metrics. Um, and they've, they've been shown to correlate with everything from stress uh, to irritable bowel syndrome um, to to overall mortality, so it, it picks up everything. Um, two more important ones are called heart rate recovery and resting heart rate. So if you've done an intense workout, your heart rate goes up, and then you stop, it's gonna go down, and the slope is actually called your heart rate recovery. And generally speaking, higher heart rate recovery, so a steeper slope, is better. So this, this illustrates that, and this is something that um, if you're an athlete, you may have used as a way to gauge whether um, your training regimen is effective. If you're a heart failure patient, they actually have you do this in, the exact, um, in a hallway. So it's the exact same metric, but it's used all across the spectrum um, of, of health. 
Um, and then resting heart rate. So this, this axis um, is drawn from about 70. Um, your heart rate is generally not zero, or, <laughs> or hopefully it's not. Um, but resting heart rate is, is the distance from, um, from zero to uh, whatever your heart rate is when it stabilizes. And generally speaking, lower is better. And so these are all important wellness metrics. This is sampling of uh, medical literature um, that, that shows actual uh, correlates all across a heart rate spectrum. So you can see resting heart rate, usually considered a metric of uh, physical fitness, um, but does correlate with things like overall mortality. Heart rate recovery, likewise physical fitness, um, also measures kind of your autonomic balance. Um, many of the things that we've talked about are controlled by your, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, which I'm not gonna get into too much detail to, but if you have questions, feel free to ask me about those. Um, and then things like heart rate um, variability, likewise can be a physical thing, um, referring to your, the balance of your autonomic nervous system, um, can also be a very temporary thing, like whether you're stressed out in that particular moment, whether you're calm, um, and people will use things like meditation or yoga uh, to have a very big difference. And then heart rhythm abnormality, not really the focus of this conference, but um, also an important thing that you get from this data. So those are some, some well-known metrics from the medical literature. Um, we, uh, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about how you could um, modify these and then um, a bit about where, where to go from here. So this is a little experiment we ran, and if, if you've ever had an Apple Watch, um, it reminds you all the time to optimize your activity rings. And so you have three of them. You have exercise um, that you're supposed to do 30 minutes a day. You're supposed to stand for 12 hours out of the day, and then you're supposed to get so many calories of movement a day. And those, those goals adapt over time. And so we looked at these versus resting heart rate as a, as a metric of overall cardiovascular fitness, and we did find uh, that there's a correlation. Um, it's particularly strong for exercise and movement. Standing does not seem to show up um, as, as much here, um, but, but the conversion factor we found is that uh, 18 minutes of exercise was on average um, equivalent to one BPM in resting heart rate. Now you can see these are, these are very wide distributions, so everybody's a little bit different. Um, and we can talk uh, in the, in the Q&A about how you could personalize some of these metrics to people. Um, but that's at least at a population level what this data looks like. Um, now the last thing we want to talk about is um, that I've shown you all these uh, biomarkers from the medical literature. These are designed uh, by humans uh, looking at patterns and saying, okay, this looks like it's gonna make sense. Uh, of course, in many fields like computer vision or speech recognition, we're now using um, techniques like deep learning uh, to automatically figure out some of the patterns. So we've run a, a sequence of experiments um, using uh, what's called semi-supervised deep learning to design new biomarkers. So I'll give you a little bit of detail. Um, this, is, this is the part that's gonna get technical, but then I'll, I'll, I'll draw back and talk about implications. So, uh, this is a neural network. The way we've set it up is actually very similar to the way a speech recognizer might be set up. And so the way you read these is actually bottom to top. Um, so the thing that goes in is heart rate, step counts, um, multiple channels, one channel for each type of sensor measurement. Um, the thing that comes out is actually in this case medical conditions because that's the data we had. Um, that's the data that was well validated. And then what happens in the middle is, is where all of the intelligence happens. So in this case, it's a convolutional neural network. We won't get into what that means, but happy to talk about it uh, afterwards. Um, and then we're doing um, what are called recurrent layers. Those are layers with loops. And the main implication here is that the neural net has some form of short-term memory. So it can kind of remember little bits of context that it's seen before uh, and build up a, a model uh, of what that, that person is like. And so what does this actually do? Well, um, and then we'll see if this animation works. Uh, nope, didn't work. Um, I was gonna show you a neural network being trained and it's actually really cool because you can see it start to separate the blue and the red, but you'll just have to take my word for it that these things are great. <laughs> um, but this is, this is an accuracy curve. So in this case, we partnered with um, UCSF Cardiology, uh, just, just up north, um, to measure uh, whether the neural network could identify 
abnormal heart rhythms and normal heart rhythms on cardioversions. Cardioversions are really from the not healthy side of, of the spectrum where you have uh, people report it feels like a three-legged washing machine in their chest. And so they come to the hospital and they're getting uh, about a 400 joule electric shock to the chest to reset their heart rhythm. So um, this, is, this is what we measured it on. Those people are actually very gracious and they wear an Apple watch and work out mode the whole time. So we get a sample of both normal rhythm and abnormal rhythm from the same person. So it's a match sample. Um, and this shows the accuracy on cardioversions. So in this case, uh, completely random would look like a diagonal line. Completely perfect would be in that top left corner. You can see here it, it's actually surprisingly accurate uh, in detecting cardioversions. In this case, the uh, area under the curve is, is above 0.9. Um, you can actually detect things that are even broader uh, than just that. So in this case, we did an experiment where we took some of those um, hand-engineered biomarkers I told you about, um, and we tried to see if they were predictive of things like whether you have high cholesterol, whether you have sleep apnea, whether you have high blood pressure. And we compared uh, three of those baselines um, with um, two different neural network algorithms. And the thing to recognize here is that the neural network algorithm beat the hand-engineered biomarkers on all three of these tasks. And to give you an idea, these numbers here, um, they're, they're C statistics. Um, so 0.5 would be random, 1.0 would be perfect. So on a spectrum of random to perfect, some of the hand-engineered biomarkers are totally random, um, like resting heart rate and its prediction of sleep apnea, that's 0.51. Um, some of the biomarkers are pretty decent. You see some 0.7s, um, but the AI-based biomarkers are doing much better. They're in the high 0.7s, low 0.8s. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of an, uh, that is maybe more technical than some of these things. Um, any of you who are into AI, happy to go into more detail. Um, but the important thing is that you can actually detect a whole bunch of things based on heart rate data if you use AI. Um, and then last, I wanted to kind of pull back uh, and say, why does all of this stuff matter? Um, and so I wanted to leave you with a couple of reviews that people have left our app on the App Store. These are people who have an Apple Watch. Uh, they don't suspect that they had any particular problem, um, but they've left these reviews that say that their Apple Watch has saved their life or their wife's life. Um, and I want to give a little example. Um, we had a user. Uh, he was going out for a run. His heart rate was 200. Um, if you're in the middle of running, that can happen. If you're really going fast, uh, but he stopped. His heart rate was still 200. Waited a little while, still 200. When he called the ambulance, it turned out he had a thing called supraventricular tachycardia. Um, that's a big, long word, but what it means is an electric circuit inside of your heart that's causing a racing heart rate. Um, and he, f he found out about this uh, through just common, everyday, uh, off-the-shelf wearable data. Um, and he, he got treatment, it's totally fine. We checked in with him, he's going to see his cardiologist. Um, but this data can actually have a huge impact on people um, all across the spectrum from, from doing exercise uh, to literally saving your life. And that is all I had to say, so thanks. Feel free to email me if you have questions. There's 60, 60 seconds for questions. Uh, uh, Robert Minky Miller, is this um, <laughs> iOS only now? And it is iOS only right now. We're part of the elites that keep ignoring Android, uh, but we want to be on Android soon. Actually, I worked on Android, so I really like am motivated to. Have How about Android feedback? Version. As far as like you know, letting people. I mean, obviously, some people got the data, but I mean, is there any alarms or alerts or things like that that indicate to the individual? Uh, when you get do. into alarms, you get into kind of FDA regulated space, so not right now, but the reason we're doing the work with UCSF um, is so that we can, we can cross that bridge, uh, but it's a longer process. And one last question to be done in half a minute. Um, hi, quick question. Um, what kind of data did you use from the Apple Watch? Was this the, the measurements that are taken every 10 minutes or is it continuous? Uh, yeah, we get, we get a mixture of them. So um, the continuous recordings you get every five seconds, and then in the newest version it gives you a reading every five minutes. So we use both of those uh, to derive metrics like resting heart rate. Right. Thank you, Brandon.